about ready. We are live. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony Ryan. I am the marketing and sales director at Ignatius Press. And today we're very honored to have one of our most popular authors as our guest today, Father Augustine Weta. Father Augustine Weta is a Benedictine priest and a monk. He'll tell us what a monk is probably sometime in this conversation for anyone who doesn't know. He is a monk at St. Louis Abbey in St. Louis. He serves as the director of chaplaincy at the St. Louis Priory School, where he teaches English and theology and classics. And I think he still coaches rugby. We'll find out here in a second. Uh, he is also the director of vocations for his uh, monastery. And so that's kind of a new job he's got. In addition to that, he spends his spare time supervising the juggling team. He's a juggler himself. He cultivates carnivorous plants. He raises carpenter ants. I know he used to be a surfer. I'm assuming maybe he doesn't get a chance to do that too much anymore, but we'll find out. And today we are going to talk to him about one of his two books with Ignatius Press. And the one today I'm holding it up here is called Humility Rules. And you can see it here, it's got a great cover. St. Benedict on a skateboard. And then also uh, he did a second book with us, probably won't be able to touch on this today, but maybe another time, The Eighth Arrow, which is a, a wonderful novel on Odysseus in the Underground. So these are our two books of Father Gus and Weta. And today we're gonna focus on, we're gonna focus on humility rules. Father, welcome. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. And since we're in my office, I thought I'd just introduce you to my aunts who are. Uh, oh, there they are. The queen, right? Wait, where wow. is she? She's right in the middle there. Wow. You can see her. Right there, there they are. Carpenter ants, right? Yep. I haven't named her yet, actually, now that I think of it. We'll call her Philomena. Beautiful. All right. And my, and my carnivorous plants are right behind me in the window. Let's see those. Okay. This is the cool those. thing about being interviewed from home is that you can do these sorts of I, ah, well, There you I, go. Yeah, well, whatever. Yep. There I you go. So them. there are his plants. There are his ants. Uh, we won't be able to meet all his students today, but uh, he can or tell anyone. us about them. So speaking of your students, so the book we're going to talk about, Humility Rules, uh, the subtitle is St. Benedict's 12-Step Guide to Genuine Self-Esteem. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the book itself, but first I want to say to you, Father, um, we've been happily surprised how popular this book has been. Uh, since it released uh, in the fall of 2017, a little less than three years ago, about three years ago, we've sold over 40,000 copies. In the Catholic world, I think even in the secular world, that's a real bestseller. Um, are you... Are you surprised by the huge popularity of this book and it's being such a consistent, strong seller? It wasn't like it just was a big seller and then it slowed down. It keeps selling. Uh, yeah. And also, let me add to that question before you answer. I know it's aimed at young adults or teenagers, actually, but it seems to us that there's a lot of adults that are reading it and benefiting from it. So, again, what, what's your uh, thought on the popularity of this book and the age range that it's reaching? Uh, well, I think, yeah, I wrote it for teenagers, but I think, uh, yeah, it's mainly selling to adults and maybe selling to adults who think they're teenagers should be reading it. Uh, though I do get fan mail every now and then from kids. Um, the, sure. yeah, you asked me yeah. if I'm surprised. Um, you know, I don't think I'm surprised, but I am thrilled. Uh, I mean, I thought it was good. That's why I got Ignatius Press to publish it. Uh, but yeah. but I guess I didn't think it was 40,000 copies good. <laughs> well, I mean, we're thrilled as well. And uh, I, I know it's yeah. doing a lot of good. Uh, let me let me just start off by reading the, uh, the first little couple sentences about the book on the back, which will lead me to kind of the opening question about the book itself. It says, St. Benedict's Fifth Century Guide to Humility offers the antidote to the epidemic of stress and depression overwhelming modern young adults today. In the language of the rule of St. Benedict, which is medieval and its most passionate advocates are cloistered monks and nuns, how then does this ancient wisdom translate into advice for ordinary people today? And so, Father, some people would say this is kind of a modern self-help book, and I guess you could call it that. There are many self-help books that have been written in the last 30 or 40 years. 
This one, as we say, is based on a rule that's 1,500 years old. So what, what makes this book different? I think it's pretty obvious, but how does it apply today? How do people benefit from this, this book that's 1,500 years old, really? Um, yeah, I, it is, I had always wanted to be a novelist. Uh, so to end up a self a self-help author is something of a, I guess a humiliation in itself. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I hate to think of my book or even the rule of St. Benedict as a self-help book, but they are, uh, you mm -hmm. can use them to help yourself, I suppose. Um, I, you know, when I wrote the book, or the reason I wrote the book was for my students, of course. And and it all started with a trip to the pharmacy for one of the old monks. I was getting him some Advil or something. And you know, they have these racks of books on the on the side, these, I don't know. And one of them was the mm -hmm. Teen Guide to Self-Esteem, Learning to mm -hmm. Love the Most Important Person in the World. And and I looked at it and I turned to the pharmacist. And I was like, this is awful. What terrible advice. I turned to the people in the pharmacy. I was like, who would ever tell this to a teenager? They already think they're the most important people in the world. And now you're just ratcheting up the pressure. And I went on. And finally, they gave me the book and asked me to leave. And, uh -huh. and I think maybe it's usefulness or perhaps it's popularity is partly because I'm a little sick of the self-help movement uh, or, or, or at least the self-esteem movement. And I think perhaps a lot of other people are too. And it, it riots at Catholic, at colleges and, and and this general intolerance that we seem to witness online or any indication that thinking you're the most important person in the world just does not serve us very well as humans. Well, so... Um you know, this book, as we mentioned, is based on this rule that's 1,500 years old. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of use what's called St. Benedict's Ladder of Humility for the 12 steps, the 12-step program. So what? tell people, what is the Ladder of Humility and why is that important for people today? It kind of adds on to what you were saying before. Well, it's really, it's at the core of monastic spirituality. Um, and it, uh, St. Benedict says that the higher you climb on the ladder of humility, the lower you go, but the closer you get to God, but the less holy you feel. A and it builds in degrees from the fear of God to, and now I'm gonna forget what the last step was. Um, well, I'll tell you because I yeah, have it right you here. Got the book there. <laughs> I got the book here, Father. On humility, and I can't tell so you. the last step is reverence. Oh, reverence, right, of course. Yeah. And so you have these sort of negative virtues at the bottom of, 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 of decreasing yourself, and then the more positive virtues as they expand. And actually, I was just rereading um, St. Augustine's commentary on the Beatitudes, and I realized it lines up pretty nicely with that too, and with the Our Father, because the petitions mm -hmm. of the Our Father start off with, um, let's see, Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And then the central one is the give us our daily bread, There's a trip for, as we forgive others. And, and St. Uh, Augustine points out that the Beatitudes work that way too. They start with poor in spirit and and the meek and so on and so forth. Hmm. And then they end with peacemakers and, 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 and things like, and the more sort of positive outgoing virtues. Yeah. Um, and I, I think St. Benedict works that way as well, uh, though in significantly more steps. Um, so besides acquiring humility, which you say is genuine self-esteem, it also talks about helping people acquire inner peace. So in other words, this book talks about dealing with the stress that a lot of people are under today. Yeah. Uh, and so besides humility, is there's this great attraction of inner peace that you help uh, people understand they can acquire. Can you talk about that? Well, people keep asking, you know, asking me, how are the monks doing? You know, how are you faring with COVID and stuff? And the truth is, we're doing just fine. We, we, this is how we've always lived. Right. <laughs> we don't go out much. We don't yeah. talk with a lot of people. Um, I, it, it certainly has changed the way we work in the school. Um, and we had to have some hard discussions around the middle of the summer because we've got two or three old monks who 
are definitely not going to handle it well if we get COVID. But they, but they themselves were like, "Look, if our times come, it's come. Mm. We're ready to go. We think about death every day. That's it's right. in the world. It's all, one of the steps of the ladder of humility." Um, mm. So really, um, it, it, it's not so much that life has changed for us as that everyone in the, else in the world became monks. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> We're all cloistered now. And, and, uh, having everyone else be monks is is a little confusing for us, I suppose. <laughs> so, but in terms of inner peace, so that's what you're saying that it helps people kind of get away from the rat race that we face and the stress sure. that people face, and and help uh, kind of get that peace that monks have in their day to day life. Yeah. Well, I hope so. Um, the, uh, the really, you know, the, the first word of the rule is listen. And, and I am increasingly convinced that this is the solution to pretty much everything it is, is if, we'll, if we will all just slow down long enough to listen to one another. Um, and here in St. Louis, you know, we had this whole controversy over the statue and, yeah. uh, uh, there's a lot. I have a long story about. I went out there and I said the rosary and so on and forth, so forth. Good for you. Yeah. Well, but the long and short of it is that the guy who was leading the movement to tear down the wrote the the statue, a guy named Umar Lee, through no, I I hadn't anticipated this, but we end. I ended up meeting him and we ended up talking and I shut up long enough to listen to him and we're having coffee next week and we're you know oh, wow. and, and I just great. feel like. You know, there were no blows exchanged. There was no spitting on each other. Not like I've seen it on the news. Um, but I did have to hear him out first. Sure. <laughs> and, sure. And I don't agree with a word he says. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't agree with me either. But there's room for civil discourse, you know, if you'll just uh, listen. Okay, just well, listen. listen. Listening is a good step in, in the, this uh, whole lesson about humility. So that's beautiful. And thank you for doing that, by the way. That's a good witness for the rest of us how to deal with these situations, which uh, you know don't often get handled as well as you handle that. Now, now the two of you sound like you're developing a friendship. Yeah, well, we've been in touch over Twitter, and every now and then he posts something that I don't particularly agree with. And and in fact, I told him uh, not too long ago. I said, you know, you that was really mean what you said the other day. And, and he wrote back and he said, yeah, okay, you got me. But I get rhetorical on the internet. And I was like, well, so do I. You know? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, now, welcome, to the, welcome to the human race on that, but go ahead. That said, like the Catholics who are out there defending the faith, you know, putting a, a there are, there is a time to fight. <laughs> so right, I'm not absolutely. Against that. it's just, I don't think that's particularly my job as a monk. And I think there's a lot of fighting that doesn't need to happen. Hey, definitely. So um, your book starts off with the first step, which is the fear of God. I think that's often misunderstood. What, tell us about the fear of God. What does that really mean? And why is that the first step on this ladder? Well, I, it's in the book and it's my all time favorite quote from C.S. Lewis that hmm. people today don't so much want a heavenly father as they want a heavenly grandfather. Like hmm. just a sort of senile old guy who doesn't much care what the young folk do so long as no one gets hurt. And he probably won't remember any of it later anyway. Um, I, I think I think we begin to take God for granted a lot these days. We tend to reduce Jesus to a sort of a social worker or a group therapist uh, and forget that he's going to come riding on the cloud with his name carved in blood on his thigh, and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And, uh, oh, my gosh, see, uh, that, sorry, I, I'm a little bit ADHD, and I was just thinking, all of a sudden, I remembered a quote from one of the Desert Fathers, because I'm writing a new book now. I'm under a lot of pressure from Ignatius Press to crank uh, okay. out a on decision making with the Desert Fathers. And, and so I've been retranslating all the sayings of the Desert Fathers. And one of them says that a demon appeared to Abbe Poeman, if I can remember this correctly, and said, I will leave this place. I will go back to hell and never come back if you will tell me exactly who are the sheep and who are the goats. And Abbe huh. Poeman says to him, well, as for the sheep, I'm not sure. 
But one thing I know is that I'm one of the goats. <laughs> and the devil is so flustered that he goes back to hell anyway. <laughs> and the the, there's something wonderfully simple about that um, yeah. that perspective, you know. Well, but, so you so that you begin. I, I'm just intrigued by this whole concept of fear of God because, as I say, it's, I think it's often yeah. misunderstood. And you begin by saying you can't have self-esteem without self-respect. Right. Because we are made in the image and likeness of God, that means you begin by respecting God. And I think that's what you mean by how it, that that's what the fear of God is. It's the respect for the, the wonder, the awe, the power, the beauty, the love of God, right? It's yeah. not being afraid of God like, you know, like maybe the Old Testament or whatever, where we have this constant fear of God. That's it's, a, it's more of an awe, respect, and because we are made in that same image, right? It is, but there's it, it's not quite awe. <laughs> and there is something of the fear there too. I mean, when you go before a judge, you yep. respect the judge, but there's that judge, I and mean, God has us. One of our monks converted to Catholicism because he read um, an old Puritan uh, sermon called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. But he talked, uh, I can't remember the author's name, but he talks about the hand hold, held over the fire, and we're in there, and he might let go of us at any minute. and the Puritans went a little bit too far in the direction of fear. But yeah. still, you know, when there's that awesome power, when you're in that presence, you should, there, part of you should want to fall on your face and say, leave me, I am evil. You know, there's nothing good in me. Um, right. there, there should be something. I, I, I'm not quite comfortable with awe. But then I don't think I, I think there's something there's a difference maybe between the fear of God and being afraid of God. I don't right. think he's going to get us. Yeah. Um, okay. And so I mean that's that's the distinction I was trying to make is you know I think I just again I think fear is is sometimes misunderstood when we're talking about God, and I think you reached the right balance. Oh, good. So. Um, there's an analogy here, actually, yeah. Sorry, if you don't mind, because yeah, I've been thinking about vocations a lot recently, and I think there are kind of two ways to think of vocations, and both of them are wrong. Um, but one of them is to say, you have this vocation, it's a calling from God, and it's kind of a secret. And if you don't figure it out, if you don't find out what God's will is for that, you're going to be miserable your whole life. And I don't think that's quite right. But then on the other hand, there's this other thing. There's this other opinion that, oh, go do whatever you want. And God will sort of adapt to that. So, the, you know, well, who's it? St. Augustine said that heresy was was trying to cage light. The truth is always a mysterious mixture of the two extremes, like somewhere somewhere out there in the middle. And I, so I don't think there's – you shouldn't be afraid of God, but you shouldn't be totally without fear. Right. Right. Well, I mean, I guess we could apply that in a natural sense to even like our parents, especially our, our fathers, right? Yeah, right. I mean, uh, a, a good spanking every now and then probably, uh, well, in my own case, it was well earned. <laughs> it looks like it worked out well for you. Well, we'll see. Uh, I'm not dead yet. So So how is it going in, in uh, your work as a vocations director? I'm just curious right now as we're talking about that. How, what's... How, I, it's got to be a little challenging with young people today, I would assume. Yeah, well, it's on the one hand, I, uh, there's been this explosion of interest because <laughs> I think for the first time, a lot of kids are thinking about death and thinking about the eternal verities and 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 they're forced to come to terms with themselves and, and the, the, the unknowableness of the future. Um, on the other hand, it's really hard to get them out here because – you know, they, we have all these restrictions. They have all these restrictions. Oh, yeah. It's um, pray for us because the whole church, I think, is having trouble figuring out how to navigate. You want to be responsible and charitable. I, like as with the mask wearing, you know, there's at, at one point it becomes sort of <laughs> oppressive. But then on the other hand, you you want to be charitable toward all. And if wearing a mask protects people right. by all means do it you know right. um, so we're we're trying to tread that thin line between keeping them out and welcoming them in <laughs> so it sounds like you're getting a lot of interest uh but the tricky part is 
uh, being able to have them come and connect with you. But hopefully yeah. down the road, not too far, that'll be able to happen more, right? I mean, well, that's we, we just had our first virtual vocations retreat and that was oh, really wow. fun and it kind of worked. Um, oh, good. I got to meet all the monks and I took them on a little tour of the monastery. And, and so we're gonna probably do that again. I oh, bet good. we will do it again. So if anybody well, else wants to see a monk, Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. I recommend it. He look how happy he is. That's genuine. He's always this way. I am. My father says I'm manic oppressive. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> I, I don't have the downs. I'm just always really on. But it is. I, I will say this: that like, it is really, really neat being a monk. Um, may get the kids talk about in your book and in your introduction to who is Father Gustin Weta in your book, uh, which I think is helpful. You talk about um, your journey, which I think young people who are listening can read that. It's short, but I mean, you talk about you know you you weren't planning on being a monk, and you know you had girlfriends and you had all these interests and things, but um, but now that you're a monk, you said you're just always, there's, there's this happiness that you have. You really love the life of, of being a Benedictine monk. And, and I think that, you know, it's it's true. It comes true in your life. And, and every time I talk to you, you, you do radiate that. Oh, thanks. I mean, that's not to say that there isn't a ton of suffering involved as well. Um, uh, one of the monks is fond of saying that you're gonna carry your cross no matter where you run. And right. you'll carry it in the monastery or you'll carry it out in the world. But either way, there's going to be suffering. I'm just yeah. personally just so grateful that God lets me carry my cross here. Uh, granted, well, let me, let you know, me uh, talking about young people, back to young people then, as we're talking about them in terms of vocations and so forth. In your book, you write about a trip to the Jersey Shore boardwalk where you saw young <laughs> people looking, you know, tired and, you know, kind of vacant and empty. So how should we reach these kinds of teens with your 12-step program for genuine self-esteem? You know, well, I was, I've changed my, 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 my position on this since I wrote the book, actually. Well, maybe not. Maybe hmm. I've just expanded it. But I, I was giving a retreat up it, to a bunch of priests up in Oh gosh, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, the the Domin the East Coast Dominicans were hosting it, and I was one of those keynote speakers. And we had a question and answer, and the priests were like, "You know, ever since the scandals, we there's just the we feel like the rug's been torn out from under us. Like there's just no way to evangelize because we've lost all of our credibility. How do you evangelize when when people are just automatically suspicious of you?" And I didn't have an answer at that moment, but on our way out of the convention center, I was walking down the steps and this kid kind of squealed in front of me on a bicycle, a dirt bike. And he looked up at me, he's wearing his baseball cap on backwards and he's got a tattoo on his arm. He says, what are you? And I looked at him and I smiled and I said, well, I'm a monk, what are you? And he looked at me and he goes, I'm a punk. And I go, well, uh, and he goes, what do you do? And I said, well, I pray. And he goes, well, that's what I do. And I go, great, punk, pray for me. And he goes, I will, monk. And he drove off. And I, I ran back into the con conference center, and I interrupted the next speech. And I got on the mic, and I said, I figured it out. Like, all we have to do is be joyful. Like, there's no just, there's, you know, it's a small, I can't debate this kid into any sort of debate, any sort of belief. And I'm never going to convince him that I'm not what he thinks. <clears throat> Thinks I might be, but I can be friendly. I can smile, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's what Mother Teresa said was the way to be a saint was to smile at the people around you. And if that's well, all you do, I think it's a major tool for evangelization. Yeah. So witness of joy, the the, mm -hmm. the, the great power of joy, and just you know you you uh, communicate with them. There's an old phrase: "To love is to communicate." So you found a way to communicate with a punk, and obviously the two of you. <laughs> Don't have a lot in common, but you found a common ground there, and he communicated with you. And, and uh, you know, who knows? Who knows what that will do for him down the road when you talk about praying and praying for each other. Mm -hmm. And it turns out we have a lot in common. His job as a punk is to pray, and my job as a monk is to pray. And so we both we both do the same things. You know. Well, I'm glad to hear that punks pray a lot. I didn't know that. <laughs> Self-described, at any rate, that's what he claimed to be. 
So, Father, a main attractive feature in this book is the um, you use some very creative and, and humorous illustrations that add modern day items like skateboards and hang gliders to classic monastic art. What's the reason for you adding these illustrations? What what tell me about that? Well, I uh, for one thing, my mother is an artist and, and a kind of a famous artist. And so I grew up around really some of the great, well, the greatest contemporary realists in North America. And wow. and and so if there was bad art in this book, I, I was just gonna be humiliated on every level. And so I, I decided that I, I could not leave the illustrations to anyone but myself. Well, and I also, I had this thing for ancient and medieval art, uh, but I knew I couldn't leave it like it was. And I also really love Photoshop. I'll Photoshop anything. I just recently Photoshopped myself into a picture of, uh, let's see, uh, Stalin meeting with, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Winston Churchill. And uh, uh, just for the fun of it. Um, but, but the other thing was that uh, I, I had a friend who was an evangelical author, a woman named Joanna Weaver, who's, who wrote a great book for women called um, Having a Merry Heart in a Martha World. And she took one look at the manuscript and I had made three or four just illustrations for fun. And she said, there needs to be one of these on every page. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and oh. she was right. Yeah. yeah. I, at first it was just sort of a joke, kind of fun, you know, because I thought maybe there might need to be a couple of illustrations. But she was the one who could. She also told me that uh, I needed a better title than Benedictine, uh, a commentary on the rule of St. Benedict for teenagers. And she was right. So did you, did, you, did you come up with the revised title yourself? Well, she said, go on Amazon and look at what's selling to teenagers. And okay. she said, uh, I'd look at self-esteem, which I, of course, spoiler alert, I don't really believe in it, self-esteem. But but that seems to be where people are going for advice. And then the other thing she said was uh, cut each chapter down to a page and a half. People are busy these days. Don't don't overwhelm them. And boy, she was right on every account. Without her, yeah. I, I can't even imagine this book being published at all. <laughs> Well, I mean, so you followed that advice. I'm looking at the book now. It's actually, we printed it on art paper so that the uh, the yeah. artwork would stand out, and it really does. By the way, the artwork is great. So, folks, Father Augustine not only wrote the book, he supplied the artwork for it, and he used Photoshop to add some really uh, humorous, uh, as we say, items to classic art. So you're really going to love it. I mean, the whole point of the art is to underscore the, the uh, kind of the – the lessons that you're teaching in each chapter. And it really, I think it really works. I think it's a really a beautiful addition. Oh, it um, is. And so, a shout out to the graphic designers and people at Ignatius. I mean, they do make beautiful books. And that's why I was so grateful that they accepted this book for publication because I really, all of their books are, are just beautifully bound. They're not temporary things that, that fall apart after a few days. That, no, they're not. No. Uh, when Father Festio started Ignatius Press, you know, his idea was he has a reverence for books. That's why when ebooks first came into existence, he he had he just hated that idea. But you know, he he you know later he realized, well, that's the way modern culture is going. We have to get we have to get up to speed, and now we do ebooks, of course. But he had this real reverence, has this real reverence for books. It's really especially Catholic books. It's something sacred. And so making them as beautiful as possible, not just the content, but also the uh, physical uh, attributes. So we use the best paper, acid-free mm -hmm. paper that will last forever. We, we sew our books as well as glue them so that, you know, you can't, you could not pull our books apart. I mean, you'd have to really work hard at it. Yep. Uh, and, and so they, they are. And then, of course, they're beautifully designed and all that. And we use beautiful typeface, everything. We really make an effort to make them beautiful. So thank you for um, saying that. Oh, well, I, it's really, uh, uh, the, it came out so much prettier than I expected. <laughs> well, I'm sure that, again, has something to do with his popularity. Uh, Father, let us uh, let me go back to um, the 12 steps again. I'm just wondering, um, again, so we're talking about self-esteem, genuine self-esteem. So how would you say that, uh, what's the difference between that and, you know, pride or our ego? Well, I actually, I just got an email the other day from a professional baseball player 
who had read my book and and he said I, I did I wanted to thank you for the book he said because everybody tells me I'm this great pitcher and every time they say that I think I ought to reply with oh well you know I really flubbed the last game or I really need to work on this or that he says now I just say hey thanks <laughs> yeah God gave me a gift you know be and I think genuine if we want to talk about self-esteem as a really positive attribute it's thanking God for his gifts in you. If, if he made you beautiful, then thank God for that. Don't, don't downplay that or smart or rich or whatever. I mean, that it's, um, it, uh, I think it's a uh, Justin Martyr who said that it does God no service to denigrate his gifts to you. So if God may, gave you a gift, you know, by all means, acknowledge it. Um, That's good. So it's That's really good accurate humility is really accurate self-knowledge it's not self-deprecation so humility is truth is a phrase you often hear and that there's that's probably mm -hmm. correct right i mean you know just as you said in other words don't deny the fact that god gave you these gifts thank him for them and thank people when they when they you know they acknowledge them yeah yeah and and, and you know if you uh, well i well, there's a wonderful, I remember it from years and years back, an interview with Michael Jordan, which was sort of a joke. It was this pop psychologist on Saturday Night Live says, don't you, uh, aren't there just days when you just feel like you just can't bounce that ball? You know, and he says, no. <laughs> but, you know, some days you have really sort of bad days when you just can't play very well. He goes, not really. You know, and, uh -huh. and the truth That's is, honest. he was the greatest basketball player ever, and he understood yeah. who he was. Yeah. And, it wasn't, and he was a humble man, too. I really, you can tell yeah. by looking at him. Uh, yeah. But it does God no service to say, no, I'm not so great. Right. Yeah, he's, exactly. um, he's amazing. So, uh, also, wouldn't you say that uh, genuine self esteem or humility is also about forgetting yourself? I mean, stop focusing on yourself yeah. and, 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 and think about others. I mean, I know that's a whole part of monastic life. It should be the part of family life. But this whole idea of forgetting about yourself. Can you talk about that? Well, I um, everything I talk about ends up with a story. But a major kind of turning point in my novitiate, I asked one of the elders of our monastery if he knew he was going to, if he knew he was saved, if he knew he was going to heaven. And he said, you know, when I think about myself and all the cruddy things I've done, he said, I'm pretty sure I'm going to hell. He said, but then I think about Jesus and and his generosity and his love for me and all the gifts he's given me. And then I'm pretty sure I'm going to heaven. So I just keep my eyes fixed on him. <laughs> and, and I think that's that's really where it's at, is keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus and taking them off yourself altogether. Well, and also thinking of others. There's this, there's this line by either Emerson or Thoreau. I always get those guys... Uh, mixed up that I really think is yeah. beautiful. And it goes like this, the mass of humanity live lives of quiet desperation, oh, yes. worrying, worrying themselves into nameless graves, while here and there a great unselfish soul forgets himself into immortality. <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's kind of what a saint is, right? Yeah, can you email me that quote after this? I will, uh, yeah, I will. I, I remember, yeah. I've always heard the first half about quiet desperation but everybody leaves out the second half about that forget it forgets himself into yeah, a great unself here and there he says he's not that comma but here and there a great unselfish soul forgets himself into oh. immortality oh, you know? that's brilliant. i mean that's really what a saint is when you when you kind of summarize there are people who forget themselves in service of god and others yeah and uh, and they become you know the people we always remember <laughs> <laughs> or, or really, I mean, if you think about it more secular terms, any, or I'm just thinking about basketball all of a sudden, but you can you can see that it's not about, he's not thinking of himself. When Michael Jordan does his thing, he's he's 100% there. You know, it's not about him anymore. I mean, any, any great author or artist or, or anything is – their eyes are taken off. The, that's why we, we know virtually nothing about Homer or Shakespeare, because they were just so great that we they, they forgot themselves entirely. And, and it's almost impossible to tell what their personalities were, because their art is completely 
outwardly focused. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to like, well, no, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, Father, uh, this time goes by fast when you're having a great conversation, and uh, we are we are we are running short on time here. So I was wondering, uh, any final thoughts from you on humility rules, and and uh, anything that you want to say about the lessons in your book and and so forth. Oh my gosh, I wish I had some wise thing to end with. But I, I, well, I'll tell you this. I was interviewed not long ago for a secular publication, and they asked me if I had two minutes, what would I tell the world? And um, it was kind of a little gift. My answer came to me sort of out from beyond. But I said, you know what? I wouldn't say anything. I'd give the whole world two minutes of silence. <laughs> And, and they thought that was really great or wise or something, but it, I think it mainly came from not having an answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but still, I think, you know, if everyone would just, you know, the prelude to listening is silence. And so I really feel that if there's anything, you know, before you, before you buy the book or read the book, don't bother with the book at all. Just go be by yourself, sit in a, sit in a closet somewhere and just be quiet for two minutes and, I think that'll help save the world. But, but after that, buy the book. Oh, yeah, book, yeah. Oh, and by the way, silence by itself is meaningless. You know, it, Jesus has to be there at the center, too. Well said, yeah. Otherwise, you get into, uh, you know, these kind of uh, false Eastern mysticism things and that, so. Right, if it's well, not Father, about um, it in prayer. I want to thank you on behalf of Ignatius Press for writing this great book and, and sending it to, to us. We're honored to have published it as well as your novel, The Eighth Arrow. Maybe sometime we can have a discussion about that. Oh, yes, please. Uh, thank, thank you for uh, taking the time to have this discussion today. It's been very uh, enjoyable, very interesting. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing your next manuscript. By the way, don't feel any stress now. Today we're talking about how to get rid of stress. And you said you're feeling this stress about writing this book. So you better you better read Humility Rules. Yeah, I better go back and listen to myself. Yeah. But on the other hand, some, a little bit of stress is okay. You know, it keeps get, keeps you moving. That's uh, okay. All right. Well, only right. a little bit. We want to, next time I talk to you, I want you to be the same happy guy. So, okay. <laughs> I won't blame you. All right. Well, Father, uh, next time you travel west, come and see us at Ignatius Press. We'd love to have I you come and visit. I have a friend in California now, and uh, I'm planning on going out there to surf next summer. So, I'll pop in. Uh -huh. Okay, very good. So you're still surfing? Yeah, I had uh, brain sur I, I You know, I have Parkinson's, uh, but I had brain surgery about a year ago, and it totally got rid of the tremors. So now that I'm back to beautiful. surfing, back to juggling, everything. That Thanks is so beautiful. God. Thanks be to God. That is great. Well, that's a great way to end it. So, Father, again, thank you very much, and uh, look forward Ooh. to talking to you again. And thank you, Ruby Gonzalez, for buying the book. <laughs> I just see she wrote some stuff. All right. Thank and you. everyone else that bought the 40,000 copies. All right. Thanks again, Father. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. You bet.